Um, so welcome all back to our second session of the High Holiday Bootcamp. I know that the first session was successful. You know, I know because your Rosh Hashanah was that meaningful that you wanted to come and hear a class tonight about Yom Kippur. If Rosh Hashanah would have been horrible, you wouldn't have wanted to be here tonight. So the fact that you're here um, tells me that uh, you're in good shape. But most importantly is that God put us all in the Book of Life and Rosh Hashanah, inscribed us in the Book of Life, a Book of Prosperity, Book of, book of Nachas, Book of Good Health and Success, and all of our heart's desires that we want to have in that good book, God willing, God inscribed us there. And now we wish each other that we should be sealed on Yom Kippur with all those blessings. So we should have what in Hebrew is called a Gemar Chatimatova. We should have a good finish sealed in the book of life and all of the best of blessings that come along with it. Amen. Amen. I think that calls for a Lachayim. And we can make a Lachayim on a sparkling water too. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehako Nihiyah Bitaro. If anybody wants to have a uh, inclusion cookie, we have one on the table. Feel free to uh, make a blessing on that. It's a Mizo note. So, question: What is what would you say is the most attended service? Annually in synagogue. <laughs> right? And it's true. For some reason, Konidre comes and everybody feels a need to be there, right? Which is a good yeah. thing. Also, the tune. It's very um, seldom that you'll have a prayer that there's such a universal tune, a little bit of a, uh, you know, a nuance here or there, but overall, it's the same tune that is sung for Konidre in almost all synagogues around the world. Y'all remember the tune, I'm sure, right? With a lot of ayayays, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we sing this prayer, Konidre, actually not once, not twice, but three times. And it's a very um, heart-steering tune that uh, Konidre is sung to. And it's a very, what you'd imagine, is a really inspiring uplifting spiritual prayer so let me read it to you in english and then tell me what you think this is the konidre prayer in english all vows self-imposed prohibitions oaths sign your paper don't worry consecrations restrictions interdictions or any other equivalent expressions of vows which we may vow swear dedicate for sacred for sacred use or prescribe for ourselves from this yom kippur until the next yom kippur which comes to us for good from now we regret them all all are hereby absolved remitted canceled declared null and void not an enforcer in effect let our vows not be considered vows let our self-imposed prohibitions not be considered prohibitions and let our oaths not be considered oaths. Something tells me that when it sounds like Nidra na la nidre, sounds more inspiring than my oath should not be oaths. In short, Konidre is saying, anything I say this year to next year, don't take me seriously. If I swear, if I promise, if I dedicate and make a pledge, it should be null and void. My word is not a word. My oath is not an oath. Don't trust me. Don't believe me. And it's, oh, yeah, yeah, right? What's, what? Why is everybody showing up for this? Now I know everybody shows up. It's a worthwhile prayer. Any dedication that I make from now to next year, I'm free off the hook. What? What's? Did you expect this to be what Konidre is all about? Chances are you may have read it in English, but... What's the uh, hype? And this is the prayer that kicks off Yom Kippur, right? Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the day that we get to experience the essence, the deepest recesses of our soul. And we enter that zone by this Kol Nidre prayer. I'm sorry, I did not find even one inspirational spiritual message there. 
All it says is all the oaths that I take upon myself from this year to next year are of null and void, and my oaths and my promises and my swears are not binding. So this year to next year? Yeah. The coming new year? From this Kona Yom Kippur to next Yom Kippur, and then next Yom Kippur, I'm going to do the same thing, make sure that all my oaths will not be oaths. I don't know. That's what I'm asking. So what? So so that's what I'm asking is, what's with the hype of Kol Nidre? It being such a awe-inspiring prayer that brings everybody in. It seems to be a little bit uh, an overhype for a prayer that should just be, you know. There's another time we do this. We have the moment of vows that we do the morning before Rosh Hashanah, early in the morning, and by the prayers, and you make a statement. Without any singing, without any major ceremony. We're going to get back to this at the end of our class tonight. I thought, I always thought it was a prayer for God's forgiveness. But I don't say it. from last year. No, no. I know, I know. But that's not what we said. So that's why we need, we need to know. We'll have to come revisit it. Okay? So that was just to give us our opening scene for tonight. And uh, we'll come back to it at the end. But now we're going to take a fascinating journey and enter the life of one of the um, greatest as well as most tragic sages of the uh, Talmud. Gerald, you know what? You come over here. And then, no, the, okay, there's a chair right here. So Gerald, comes sit over here. And then uh, Chana and Shleima otherwise known as Anya and Sergei, can sit down back there and feel comfortable. Don't be, don't be sorry for being late. We're happy you're here. L'chaim, welcome. I also want to dedicate our Torah study tonight for the good health for Eliezer ben Friedel, that he should have only good health and many long healthy years to come. And all those, if there's anybody that you know that needs blessings for good health, um, Include them in our Torah study tonight. And obviously, as always, our brothers and sisters in Israel are always first and foremost on our minds. Um, obviously, yesterday being October 7, a, a very um, heavy and important day. Um, definitely, we bless that October 8 should be the day of uh, salvation. God still has a few hours, and he should turn October 8 from being a sad day as well into being a day of of rejoicing, and we dedicate our Torah study to our brethren in Israel as well. Um, so, we're going to learn about, it's interesting, close to a thousand sages that are recorded, their teachings are recorded, and we're active members in the transition of the Jewish tradition from generation to generation. You find one that completely left the fold of Judaism and went to the furthest extreme from Jewish observance that he became actually anti-Jewish. Hello, Mrs. Kaufman. I I'm sorry that you have to be the uh, sacrifice, but it's wonderful. I have to take out more chairs at the class. Let me go. Okay. Okay. A man by the name of Elisha, the son of Avuya. You ever heard of him? Chances are you haven't heard of him because his name is only mentioned one time in the entire book of Talmud by name. Um, one time in the, I think, the third chapter of Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers in the Mishnah. Otherwise, he is always referred to as another name, Acher. The other one. So let's learn a little bit about this man. Text one. This is from the Talmud. The tractate of Chagiga. And it says, our rabbis taught. Four entered the vineyard. Now, the vineyard is not a physical space. The vineyard refers to, in Hebrew, it's called the Pardes. Pardes means people, four great sages that went on a journey. They didn't take LSD. But they went on a spiritual journey in discovering the deepest mystical elements of the Torah. So they went on a very high 
or a very deep journey into the uh, essence of Jewish mysticism. For the, who were these men? There was a man by the name of Ben Azai. The second one was Ben Zoma. The third one was Acher, who I told you earlier is Elisha, the son of Avuya. And the fourth one was Rabbi Akiva. Unfortunately, the journey did not go well. Ben Azai gazed and died. Ben Azai actually, his soul expired. His soul, did, from experiencing such a high level of spirituality, his soul left his body and wanted to return to its maker. His, his, his vessel, the body could not handle anymore this level of closeness to God, and he died. Ben Zoma gazed and was injured. Meaning Ben Zoma actually, unfortunately, went mad. His, his mind couldn't handle it, and he... Uh, lost his uh, mental health. Acher cut saplings, and we'll see in soon what, what in the world that means. And Rabbi Akiva, it says, entered in peace and departed in peace. Rabbi Akiva, the great sage, Rabbi Akiva was the only one who was able to handle. He entered in a way that he was capable of handling and receiving this great spiritual um, enlightenment and, and, and awareness, and he left with it internalized within his character and he was able to continue on living but the other three um completely um either physically actually expired died or mentally could not handle it and then we see after he went to cut saplings what is that expression for so let's continue so it tells us what happened after embarked upon evil ways he really went rogue he went out and solicited a prostitute she said, but are you not Elisha, the son of Avuya? This is weird. You're that great sage from the study hall. What are, you, what are you doing here? So what did he do? He then plucked a radish off its bed on Shabbat. Basically, one of the 39 prohibitions on Shabbat is we're not allowed to um, shear. We can't, no, well, not, not shear, um, cut, what is it called? Harvest, right? When you, when you cut something from the ground. So she tells him, aren't you this great sage? And he goes and pulls um, a, a, a bed of uh, radishes. Basically, he goes and violates the Shabbat in front of her. Mm. That's what it means. He says, cut saplings, meaning he went and completely, the, this story that he showed her, I'm not, I'm not Mr. Holy anymore. I don't even keep Shabbat. So she said, ah, he's someone else. He's Acher. And that's actually where he got the name from, from this uh, um, special woman who uh, special in quotations, obviously, um, who gave him the title. Ah, oh, you're not Alicia Ben Avuya, you're somebody else. So this is and 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 it's a very sad story because not only did he try to commit every possible sin in the book, we'll soon see more stories, but he went out of his way to use his Jewish knowledge to help the Romans persecute the Jews. So just historical background, he lived um. Um, soon after the destruction of the Second Temple, so about the year 70 CE, um, he lived about then. Um, and he, he, he joined forces with the Romans when they had all these decrees of not allowing Jews to observe Judaism or to study Torah. Just one example, um, the Romans wanted to make the Jews violate the Shabbat. So one of the prohibitions on Shabbat is carrying something in a public domain, from a private domain into a public domain, and without getting into details, but something that could be carried by one person. And if two people carry it together, so then it's not the same level of violation. So what did the Jews do when they were being forced to carry something? They carried it together. So Elisha came and tells the Romans, no, no, no. There's a science behind what they're trying to do. They're trying to minimize their violation. That's why they're holding it together. Make them carry it on their own. And then he told them there's, there's the, the way, they're not actually carrying it into a real halachic, Jewish legal public domain, they're taking into a neutral domain, make them take it into... So he used his Jewish scholarship to actually help the Romans really persecute the Jews. And, and for the most part, you see, he's never mentioned by name because the sages were so um, hurt and disappointed and, 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 and as you can imagine, um, the, almost disgusted by him, they didn't even want to mention him by name. And they referred to him as Acher, the other one, the other one. All of the sages completely um, disconnected themselves from him, except for one. 
he had one student from when he was in the days when he would teach Torah, everybody would speak about his classes. When he gave a class, everybody was there because his brilliance and his ability to explain things, esoteric ideas, deep ideas, complicated ideas in a way that everybody could understand them was legendary. So everybody wanted to be his student and learn from him. And one of his great students was a man of by the name of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir is one of the most commonly mentioned sages in the Mishnah. In fact, his name is Meir, which means he illuminates. His brilliance illuminated the eyes of the sages. And Rabbi Meir was a student of this great sage who gone rogue. So this is, everybody disconnected from Elisha except for Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir said, he's still my teacher. It may be that he's uh, not acting in line, but he's still a brilliant teacher and I want to learn Torah from him. But the sages said, but the vessel, the vessel that's giving it over is so impure and so horrible. How could you study Torah? So he said, I'm going to take the wine and throw away the pits. As though be careful to only receive from him what is necessary and all of his heretical and, and uh, antagonistic views about Judaism, I'm not going to receive from him. So now there's a story that the Talmud tells us of what happened one fine Shabbat when Rabbi Meir is going for a walk, studying with his former teacher and continues to be his teacher, speaking about Torah discussions on a Shabbat. So let's see this text too. Our rabbis taught. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to upload this, this uh, text to PDF on Google Drive so that those on Zoom could see like we had last time. But it's too late now. So I'm going to read it. Hopefully you could hear every word. Um, and later, if you want, I could email you the... Uh, the uh, um, PDF of tonight's lesson. But can you hear? It doesn't work even without the text. Can you still get what's going on? Yeah. Excellent. Jordi, I'm glad I can count on you to get feedback. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see what happened. Our rabbis taught. Once, Acher was riding a horse on the, sub on the Sabbath or on Shabbat, which is also already forbidden to ride a horse on Shabbat. And Rabbi Meir was walking behind him to learn Torah from his mouth. So imagine this, it's Shabbat. Rabbi Meir, this great sage, is walking with his uh, this former uh, great sage, now uh, anti-Jew, riding his horse, and he's teaching him Torah. Now, Acher said to him, Meir, turn back, for I have already measured by the paces of my horse that the Sabbath limit extends only this far. Now, one of the, again, one of the uh, laws of Shabbat is that one may not, even if you're traveling by foot, you can't leave the city past a certain distance, 2,000 cubics, otherwise known as 3,500 feet. Okay? So, Rabbi Meir is obviously engulfed and, and, and you know, deeply in, 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 involved in this Torah discussion that he's having with his teacher, Elisha ben Abuya. He doesn't realize that he had, um, you know, already left the city and he's about to pass that red line where it would have been 3,500 feet past the, uh, the uh, limit that one wouldn't be allowed to leave. Now imagine this. Acher, he's the one teaching. So he's having this deep discussion about Torah study. That causes Rabbi Meir, who's a great Jew, to lose track of where he is. But at the same time, Acher is managing to also calculate, counting these step paces of his horse. So he knows exactly at which point is the limit of the uh, Tuchum Shabbat, the boundary beyond the city that one could go to. So this gives you a little bit of an in insight into the, the brilliance and the, the, this, the, the mental abilities that this man had. But he tells, one second, but he tells Rabbi Meir, turn back. And Rabbi Meir sees the opportunity. Turn back is not only physically, but also metaphorically, right? Figuratively. Turn back. Return, right? This is the zone beyond the observance of Shabbat. This is the zone beyond Jewish tradition. And return, turning back means come back into the uh, element and of, of, and the area of, of, of Jewish observance. So Rabbi Meir turns to Acher and he tells him, you too turn back. 
Obviously, he loved his teacher and he cared. He was pained by the way he was living. He says, you too, turn back. Join, come back to, you, I, you still appreciate Torah study. Come back to the Jewish people. So Acher answered, have I not already told you that I have <coughs> already heard from behind the veil, return wayward children except for Acher. So what is Acher saying? He tells him as follows. He says, I heard a heavenly voice, and we'll soon see more information about this. You know what? Let's see it actually right now. What was this response? What is he saying? I've already heard return wayward sons except for Acher. So let's see. The same story is recounted in the Jerusalem Talmud. Did you know that there were two Talmuds? There's a Babylonian Talmud, and there was a Jerusalem Talmud. Why two? Why not, you know? Two tablets, two right? Two but really, it was very, it's, it's not. It's two centers. In they were actually 150 years apart. It's very different things. There was a man by the name of Rabbi Yochanan who um, authored a Talmud in Jerusalem, like you said. And then 150 years later, Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Ashi, they were the ones who compiled the, the Babylonian Talmud, basically modern day Iraq. So there's. Sometimes there's um, things that are shared. The Jerusalem Talmud is much more um, concise. The yeah. Babylonian Talmud has a lot of back and forth discussions. The Jerusalem Talmud gets to the point much quicker, so it's a lot shorter. But you see also a similar story, almost um, identical, but some differences shared in the Jerusalem Talmud. So let's see, and there gives us more information about what Acher was saying. So let's see that text three. Right, so they're walking, and Acher said to him, "Enough, Mayor. This is the Sabbath boundary." He asked him, "How do you know?" Acher replied, "I have measured two thousand cubits based on the footprints of my horse." Right, so Rabbi Mayor said, "You have such wisdom, and you do not return, meaning you you care enough about Shabbat to tell me not to violate it. So you do care about it. Join me." Acher replied, "I am unable." Rabbi Mayor asked, "Why?" Acha replied, once, once, on a Yom Kippur that fell out on Shabbat, which is this year, right? This year, Yom Kippur is on Shabbat. I was riding a horse in front of the Holy of Holies. Now, it gives you also an understanding of how far he'd gone. On Yom Kippur, on Shabbat, he, he's violating both, riding his horse. And where does he go to trample with his horse? On the place where the Holy of Holies, where the temple stood, he's riding on his horse on the temple mount in the place where the Holy of Holies once stood and now is destroyed. And he says, when I'm there and I heard a heavenly voice emerging from the Holy of Holies saying, return my sons, except for Elisha ben Avuya, who knew my power yet rebelled against me. So what Acher tells Rabbi Meir, in short, he says, I heard this voice on that Yom Kippur when I was riding on my horse on the ruins of the temple. I hear this voice. Shuvu banim shovavim, a verse that comes from um, Jeremiah. That's text four. Return, backsliding children, meaning children who have gone wayward, says the Lord. For I possess you and I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. It's a verse that God is saying, return. I want you to come back to me. Come back, literally come back, figuratively return to God. So here the, he hears this voice saying, every Jew, come back to God, except for Acher, you are a person that is not welcome. So he tells Rabbi Meir, I know that I can't do teshuva. I know I can't return because I clearly heard this heavenly voice telling me that all, all are welcome except for me. No. One second, we'll see you soon. That's what he tells Rabbi May. Obviously a very tragic, very tragic story. A person of such incredible abilities um, in being able to study and to teach and to go to such a extreme uh, distance from Judaism, but at the same time, you could see that internal struggle, how he's suffering um, with with um, his identity. And then is told that he's not welcomed. There's actually two versions of what the, his end was. One version is that he actually died as this heretic, and um, in fact, the Talmud tells us that his student, Rabbi Meir, and then another student, Rabbi Yochanan, tried very hard to try to get him into hell so that he could one day get to heaven. 
And the other version is that actually before he died, he did do Teshuvah. He did, and Rabbi Meir testified about him that he died as a about Teshuvah, a person who returned to Judaism. Now, exactly what happened, um, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But uh, there's no clarity exactly what the end is. Possibly both of them happened to some extent, um, but we don't know. But I want to, I want to delve a little bit into this story, because obviously this is a story that shares with us a lot about number one Yom Kippur, that is on Shabbat this year. Heavenly voices saying, everybody return, not Acher. Number one, the first question is, what's the point of a heavenly voice coming out and saying, everybody return except for you? Like, there, there is this concept of heavenly voices that come out, and I would say is ordinary people don't hear them. As the saying goes, if you speak to God, you're a pious person, but if God speaks to you, then you belong in a uh, certain institute. You know what I mean? If you hear God speaking to you, um, so, 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 but obviously, Elisha ben Avuya was, a, was, was on a level that he was able to hear such a message coming from the Holy of Holies. But the question is, what's the point? What's the benefit in telling Elisha ben Avuya, you're not welcome? You're, you want to tell him, you're, you're a no good Nick and you'll remain a no good Nick. That doesn't seem in line with what God wants. If you can tell me the message is, everybody is welcome return, I, I get it. Why, why you would want... On a moment like that, it's Yom Kippur and there's an opportunity there and he's so close to such a holy place, even though perhaps emotionally so distant, so you utilize the opportunity to let a voice come from that holy place and say, you're here already, you know, jump right in, um, return, you're always welcome. I can understand the need for, for such a heavenly voice, but what's the point in telling him, everybody's welcome except for you? What's the benefit? Why would a heavenly voice like that come out? That's number one. Number two, there seems to be an interesting difference in the in the uh, version of the stories. Yeah. In the Talmud of the Babylonian Talmud, it says that God said, um, Shuv Badim Shovavim, right? Quoting that verse, return wayward children, except for Acher. Whereas in the Jerusalem Talmud, it says, return wayward children, except for Elisha ben Avuya. Which one was it? Did it say his, did, did he hear the heavenly voice say Acher? Or did he hear the heavenly voice say, Alisha ben Avuya? Which one was it? And also, what does that mean? He's not welcome because he has, he knows my power, yet rebelled against me. Meaning, he knows what's good and he's choosing to do the wrong thing, therefore he's not welcome. And the biggest question I have is, how does this verse fit in with the fundamental teaching of Judaism that there is absolutely nothing that could stand in the way of teshuva? In fact, the Talmud tells us, to bring out this point, the Talmud tells us that even a person who committed the worst sins their entire life, if at the last moment of their life, they had true remorse and regret and resolved to change, then they are completely forgiven for all of their wrongdoings. Their teshuva is accepted and there's nothing that could stand in the way of true and wholesome repentance. And the Talmud puts a story in case to bring that out. There was a man by the name of Eliezer, the son of Durdaya who put uh, any mafioner that you may have read about or watched the movie about to shame. This guy was a, a real bandit. He robbed people. He murdered people. He, he did every horrible crime possible. And one day, he uh, chanced upon a great sage having bad intentions. And somehow the sage was able to get to him, to make him realize how bad his ways were. And he realized that he, the Thomas says he put his head in between his knees and he was just cried and wept and wept with such remorse for all of his wrongdoings. And he actually died. He died through in, in, that, in that weeping. And a heavenly voice came and said, Welcome, Reb, Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya indicating that this wasn't a person that was viewed as all of the horrible things that he's done throughout his life, but in the last moment, viewed by the teshuva that he did. Now, it doesn't mean we should spend our life doing the wrong things, and then at night, uh, that's not a good idea, um, because life is not only about what we're going to get as a reward for it. Life is about utilizing every moment of life to do good. So we have to do that. Um, also, you never know when your last moment is also. So that's a side point. Um, so, well, so how does that fit in with Acher? Why is Acher excluded from that rule 
that there's nothing that could stand in Teshuvah. And when the Talmud tells us the rule, there's no buts, there's no except for the following people. Yes, Jim. He's not repenting. Yes, he's not. So he's just riding a horse on Yom Kippur by front of the Holy of Holies, but there's no repentance there. True, good, but it seems like the voice is telling him, don't bother doing Teshuvah, because you're not going to be accepted. Wayward sons return. But don't, not you, you're not going to be accepted. So even if, that, it seems like that's what he's telling Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir says, return with me. And he says, I wish I could, but I know I can't because my teshuva would never be accepted. Right? Yes, at that moment when he heard that voice, it seems like he was definitely not engaged in any act of teshuva. But the heavenly voice is coming and telling him, return. Not you. Don't return because you're not going to be welcome. That, that's, that, that doesn't sound Jewish. Right, but there's nothing that could stand in the way of teshuva. So that's what we have to understand. So that's what we have to understand. Why can't he do teshuva? So now I want to ask you, share with you another, another um, interesting similarity that we have to somewhat connected to this idea that would help shed light on this story. Who's who's your favorite biblical character? Anybody? Who's your favorite biblical character? Obviously, Moshe. Your name is Moshe. You love Moshe the best. And I love Shmuel the prophet the most, you know? But uh, the truth is, who's yours? Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> you see, we're all so objective and unbiased. I'm biased at all. How about you, Simona? Who's your favorite? Rana. Rana. Okay. Anybody? What, so you have a favorite? No, my favorite. King Solomon. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anyone? Or are you still getting to know them? Um, I like the story of Joseph. That's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. He's, to be honest, <laughs> he's definitely my favorite. Everybody knows the story of Joseph and the uh, colorful dream coat, right? One of the best stories that corrupt the story of Torah because they portray it the wrong way and everybody thinks everything that happened is exactly how it happened, but it's still gives people a familiarity with a good story. So Yosef, right? Joseph. <coughs> you know why he has that name? Who named him that name Yosef? His mother. His mother was Rachel, Rachel. And the Torah actually tells us why she gave him the name Yosef. Remember, Rachel was really the first, uh, Jacob's ideal first choice of who he wanted to marry. And then... Rachel's dad, Laban, was a uh, first-class swindler, mm -hmm. and uh, the night of the marriage, he uh, had Leah marry Jacob instead of Rachel, and Rachel was self-sacrifice, um, so that her sister wouldn't be ashamed, told her a certain code that she received from Jacob, mm -hmm. so that she was ready to forgo a full life with Jacob, um, and suffer in misery, possibly, just so that her sister wouldn't be ashamed, um, and end Jacob marries Rachel, and uh, years and years she's barren. She has no children. And here she is kind of sharing her husband with Leah and a uh, very difficult life. Finally, after years and years of waiting for a child, she has that child that she's been praying for, she's been waiting for, and her son is born. So what does it say? Text five. So she named him Joseph, or in Hebrew, Yosef. Saying, may the Lord grant me yet another son. Yosef Hashem Li, Yosef means to add. Yosef Hashem, God should add Li for me, Ben Acher, another son. Now ask any therapist, how good is for that for your child's self-esteem to name them, you're not good enough, I want another child. <laughs> What's your name? I'm the one that my mother wanted another brother. <laughs> my name is my mother needed another son. That's isn't it? That's strange, no? Yeah. Also, you finally been waiting for this child. Why don't you call him maybe Simcha? Joy. Like all the other names. God has answered me. God has, has, has given to me. God has triple blessed me. Yosef, the boy that I need another. Maybe she's so happy she just sick. Yeah, but, but, but you can think twice before you give a name. You don't just pick a paper out of the box and see what's the, the, the first word in that comes to me in the newspaper. You know what I mean? It's, it's a... 
And you see there's a connection here again with the Ben Acher, the son that is a Acher, another son, somehow connected to Yosef. So I want to share with you a beautiful explanation of the story of Acher that will explain also what Yosef's name is all about, which will give us an understanding of what Bonidri is all about, which will give us then a proper appreciation of what Yom Kippur is able to offer us. So what do you see here? See this Alisha ben Abuya. He's a, interesting. He's a very religious Jew. He, he observes Yom Kippur. You know, that there was a uh, um, great man, unfortunately, he died a few years ago, Rabbi Adin Steinsaus. Yes. He was known as, a, as a, a genius of a century, a man who authored tens of books. He was the first one to, <coughs> to translate the Talmud into modern Hebrew and then into English, wrote many, many books, an incredible man. So for many years, he would give a Talmud class in a university in Jerusalem. And there was one professor that would never show up to the class. So he came to this professor who will call him a more um, secular Israeli Jew. And he said, why don't you come to my Talmud class? He said, listen, you think I belong at your Talmud class? He says, I don't, I, I, I'm not kosher. But generally speaking, I don't eat pork. He said, there's one day a year that I specifically go to eat pork and that's on Yom Kippur. He goes, that's how irreligious I am. She so says, I don't understand. We're the same. There are certain observances that I have specially for Yom Kippur. And you have certain observances <laughs> that you have specially for Yom Kippur. The only difference is we're both observant Jews. We observe Yom Kippur. The difference is what we do. Mm -hmm. You go to eat pork on Yom Kippur and I don't eat anything. And I wear a white uh, talus and a, and a kittle and I pray. He said, why are we so different? We both observe. <laughs> so, and then you see that, right? That it, that. There's no religious Jew as a, as a Jewish atheist, right? There's such a passionate in the atheism with fervor, right? There's, there's a, we, 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 you could take, you could take a Jew out of Judaism, but you can't take the Judaism out of the Jew, right? It's part of who we are. And you see this, this Acher, right? What's, what was, what, 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 what was he lacking on Yom Kippur? He had to go ride on a horse specifically in the place. What's the place of the Holy of Holies? That's the place that only once a year the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies to perform the Yom Kippur service. So somehow, the deepest recesses of his soul are calling him somehow to be able to come to that place that symbolizes Yom Kippur's service. Unfortunately, the way it translates itself is in the most um, grotesque violation of Yom Kippur by trampling on a horse in that place. But you see something interesting. There's something there. And what is that voice that comes out from heaven? The voice that comes out from heaven says, Shuvu banim shovavim, a loving voice being addressed to this man, Elisha ben Avuya, saying, return my wayward son. You're, you see, Elisha, you see you're being beckoned. You see there's a part of you that still feels connected. At your deepest recesses of your soul, you feel like you belong here. Return. Return to who you are. But it says chutz. Chutz means outside. Leave outside acher. Leave outside this foreign identity that you have taken on for yourself. You are welcome. But shed yourself of acher. Shed yourself of this otherness that has taken hold of you. Almost like this demon that has completely taken hold of you in this irrational way. You are welcome. Because there isn't anything that could stand in the way of Teshuvah. There is absolutely nothing that could tarnish the essential connection that each one of us has with God. Because our essential connection with God is not based on what we do, but is based on who we are. And nothing we do could diminish who we are. So the voice comes out to him lovingly and says, Shuvu banim shovavim, return. Let go of this acher. Let go of this foreign otherness that has taken hold of you. And the tragedy of the story is that he didn't hear what the voice said. He heard something else. You know, in general, when there's a dispute between the Babylonian Talmud and Jerusalem Talmud, Jewish law always follows the Babylonian Talmud. Because it was later. So they already had the information shared by the Jerusalem Talmud. They were able to analyze it. 
you know, dissect it and then come out. If they came up with a different decision, it must be they had more things to take into account than was in the Jerusalem Talmud. So in Jewish law, we follow the Babylonian Talmud. Obviously, this is not related to law. But let's say the reality, what happened, let's follow the version of the Babylonian Talmud. It said, return, but shed yourself. Get rid of this acher. The Jerusalem Talmud perhaps is telling us what he heard. You know, sometimes... Any of you that have been in a relationship for some time know that you could tell. I'm going to pick on the husbands again, but a wife tells the husband one thing and he hears the opposite. Somehow, you know the story with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, uh... oh, yeah, yeah, this is such a good joke. I'm forgetting it already. I'm sorry. Um, oh, the wife who tells his, her husband, um, If you could please go to the grocery store. I'm going to ruin it. I'm not going to, I'm forgetting it now. I'm sorry. The idea is as follows. Many times, even happens even sometimes in a class that I'll ask somebody for feedback about what they heard. And somehow the message they got was not at all what I had even knew about, let alone intended to say. A lot of people hear their own things, right? You say one thing, and that's part of the art of communication, is to be able to get the feedback, right? That's number one rule of communication. Ask for feedback. What did you hear me say, right? Side point, by the way, our upcoming JLI course is actually going to be a six-week course all about relationships, which also connects to communication. So as a paid uh, promo here, I'm letting you know that uh, more to come on that. But what happened here? The heavenly voice came out and said, you are welcome, but rid yourself, chutz me'acher, but not this otherness of you that is not you. And unfortunately, what did he hear? Everybody is welcome except for Elisha ben Avuya. He heard it saying that he, unfortunately, he identified himself not by who he truly was, but he saw this external foreign persona as being his true identity and he heard it, the voice saying that he is not welcome. And that's part of the tragedy of what happened. There's a concept of a person who is a ben acher. You have a child who is a ben, a child, but sees himself as an other, sees himself as an outcast, sees himself as the one that's not part of the fold, not welcome which was Joseph's story. What happened to Joseph? His brothers never understood him, said, you're not part of us. You don't belong here. They try to kill him. They for Then they kidnap him and they sell him off to Egypt. In the end, what does this Joseph prove? That not only is he capable of being part of the fall, but much more, he has a much deeper reality than they do and he saves ultimately the entire society from famine through his clarity and always realizing that wherever he is he's there for a reason to see the best of what he is and 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 he rises to, to great power and has incredible impact and his brothers later come to see it rachel the prophetess knew what joseph needed told him yosef i'm giving you the in your name that from those that tell you that you're a ben acher those that will come and tell you you're a child that is an other child is one that is not there you should add him. You'll be able to have additional awareness and clarity to be able to turn from that acher, a child who's told that they don't belong into being a ben. His mother wasn't telling him, you're the child that is not good enough because I need another child. You're the one that will always be able to have additional awareness and spirituality and clarity to know that when people accuse you of being acher, other, no, you're truly a ben. You're truly a son. You're truly a child and you do belong. That's what the heavenly voice was trying to tell Acher. Return and rid yourself of Acher. You're not Acher. But sadly, he heard. Return, but Elisha ben Afuya is not welcome. Mm. And that's part of the tragedy of this story. And unfortunately, there are countless of Jews who walk into the synagogue on Yom Kippur and they turn, look at themselves and they say, I don't know if I belong here. Can I honestly turn to God and say, as we say in our prayers, my parent, our king, 
if we're like children, have compassion to us as a parent has compassion on the children. If we're like servants, have compassion like a master to his servant. I don't know that I act like a child of God. I don't know that I act as if God is my king. And I walk around the whole year running my own life. As the old story goes, you go to a, uh, um, a church on Sunday and you ask someone leaving the church, are you religious? They say, yeah, obviously that's why I'm in church. Do you believe in God? Yeah, why else would I be here? You go on Friday to a mosque and you ask someone leaving, do you believe in Allah? Yes. Are you religious? Yes. Don't you see me leaving the mosque? Go Yom Kippur to a temple and you see a Jew leaving and you ask them, do you believe in God? And they're like, I don't know what you call belief. I don't know what's God. Are you religious? No, God forbid. So what are you doing here? And they say, what do you mean? It's Yom Kippur. <laughs> and that's the reality, right? So perhaps someone can, can walk into the synagogue and say, I don't believe in God, but I should pray to the God that all year round I act like, and even now I don't know if I believe in. I'm an acher. I'm not deserving of God's compassion and blessings. And do I truly, can I truly say that I'm part of the community here? Can I look to my right and to my left and say, I identify fully with my fellow Jew, and therefore God look down at this entire congregation as one wholesome entity that is your children, your followers? I don't know that. And that's why, what do we start off with on Yom Kippur? All those oaths, all those vows, all those things that I tell myself I am and all those things that I tell myself I'm not, all of the descriptions that I give to myself, all the labels that I give to myself, all of the definitions that I give to myself, all of the abilities that I prescribe to myself and the inabilities that I say that I can never achieve, you want to enter the zone of Yom Kippur. You want to enter that place of Yom Kippur, which is what? What is Yom Kippur? It's the place where we experience our soul. The first thing is leave your labels, leave your definitions, leave all of your insecurities, leave all of those oaths and limitations that you put upon yourself at the door because every single person is a child. Nobody is an acher. Nobody is an other. And if they act like one, they should know that's not who they truly are. It's a foreign identity that has taken hold of them. But at our core, at our essence, who are we? One with God. A child of God. And then I understand why everybody wants to be there at Kol Nidre. Is there anything more uplifting, more freeing than letting ourselves know that I'm not a mediocre person? I'm not all those things that people don't truly understand me, label me with, or even the things that for because of circumstances I'm not aware of, therefore I lay myself on people say, well, I'm a bad Jew. So sorry, hurtful when I hear that. I mean, you're a bad Jew. You may be a more observant Jew, a less observant Jew. You may know more, you may know less. And let me ask you this, and whose fault is it when somebody is born into a family that did not give them a Jewish education? If you're asking me, that's God's fault, not their fault. So what do Shouldn't God be happy that they even do show up once a year? Let alone think about the fact that for thousands of years we've been persecuted for the fact that we're Jewish. Let alone that a year after October 7, not only didn't we just shrink and fall away as Jews, but we said we'll be back prouder. If you're going to tell me today there's a Jew that's an acher, today there's a Jew that's an other, on the contrary, the heart and the soul of the Jewish people is more proud and more vibrant, so much more bright and shining. We should never, never allow anyone to tell us or ourselves to tell us that we're not worthy of having a meaningful, soulful relationship with God. And that's what the Kol Nidre tells us. And that's what this what sets the tone for Yom Kippur. And once we have that, once we have that Kol Nidre, we can then begin the experience of, of Yom Kippur. And what is unique about Yom Kippur? I'm sorry that I didn't have enough jokes for tonight's class. Or in fact, any. I guess Yom Kippur, I'll save them, I'll save them all for Yom Kippur during services to keep everybody alive. I'm Yom Kippur, you'll hear it, you'll hear all, you'll hear all of them. But what, what, what is the journey of Yom Kippur? What do we hope to, to, to experience? So, 7.51, I'm going to ask you a question. Number one, how are we doing here? Did we, did we, did we, I'm going to just recap what we, the main idea, what we learned here. Kol Nidre is the idea again all the oaths meaning all of those things that I tell myself I am and I'm not 
It's not true. That's right. This whole story of Acher, he misheard. The voice said, you're welcome. Acher is not. Unfortunately, he heard it saying, everyone's welcome, but you're not. Because he identified himself by that Acher. That's not who he was. Joseph was the child who needed that extra dose when everybody tells him you don't belong, that he should have the ability to add, have more clarity, more awareness to know how to view himself. And we all could be that Joseph at times if we feel that way. But what is now, we now understand now how we enter Yom Kippur, what we got to do. So what is the actual journey of Yom Kippur? So what do you, what's the translation of Yom Kippur? Yom is day. What does Kippur mean? Day of Atonement. That doesn't make sense to me. How is there a Day of Atonement? A day atones? I can understand if you do certain things, you'll get atonement. But today is the Day of Atonement without any 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 criteria. See, the Talmud says that Yom Kippur atones for everybody, whether they do Teshuvah, whether or not. How does that work? I could say Yom Kippur, the shop is opened. And those that do teshuva will be atoned. But calling it the day of atonement means that the day itself offers atonement. How does a day offer atonement? Isn't there a process that we need to go through? Yeah. But it seems like the, 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 you don't need to go through that. Now you should go through that process. I'm a fan. You should come to show. And you're welcome to join us here. But it's telling us more. The Thomas says that the day itself atones. How does the day atone? So it's interesting how in Judaism, certain things that are technical, that seem to just be just items on, 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 on the list, but really they convey deep messages. We see something interesting. In Yom Kippur, we have five services, five prayers. Every day of the year, how many do we have? Three. Okay. Morning, afternoon, and evening. Mm -hmm. On Shabbat and on Jewish holidays, four. Shacharit morning, Musaf, an additional one, and then afternoon and evening. On Yom Kippur is the one day a year that we have five prayers. Shachar, we could begin the Konidwe and then Arvit, the evening. Shacharit the morning, Minchad afternoon. Sorry, Musaf, the additional one, Minchad afternoon. And then we have at the end of Yom Kippur, Ne'ila, the closing service. Why do we have five services? Because we all have five levels of our soul. The first three levels of our soul, the the most elementary level of our soul is our biological soul, the soul that directs, it interacts with our actions. The second level is the emotional level of our soul. We access that part of our soul through our emotions. The third level is our intellectual soul. So on a given day, we have three prayers because through these three prayers, we have the ability to tap into and interact with the three powers of our soul that are basically our functionality, intellectually, emotionally, and um, actively. Shabbat and holidays, because we detach ourselves from materialism, from the mundane elements of life, and we can tap more into soulful, spiritual reality, we're able to access the fourth level of our soul. What is the fourth level of our soul? Willpower, right? Our willpower drives everything else, right? If there's a will, there's a way. When you're motivated, you want to do something, you'll understand it better, you'll be more emotional about it, you'll do a better job. That's on Shabbat. The fifth level of the soul, an ordinary day, we don't have... Ability to really tap into it. Only on Yom Kippur. What's the fifth level of our soul? Yechida. Yechida means oneness. It's the essence of our soul. Not how my soul functions, but who I am at my essence, at my core. And who I am at my core is, I'm one with God. And on Yom Kippur, we can access the level of our soul that is one with God. Now let me ask you. Is there anything you could do to be more one with God or anything you could do to be less more, less one with God? No. There's things that you could do to feel closer to God. You could be more inspired. You could be more aware intellectually. You could feel more love or fear and you can act more like God. Those are the four levels of the soul. But on who you are, the fact that you're one with God, there's nothing that you could do to become closer. There's nothing bad you could do to become more distant. <clears throat> Being that on the day of Yom Kippur, we access that level of our soul that we're one with God, it becomes the day of atonement. What, 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 what does atonement mean? Those things that ordinarily separate us, give us the inability to have the awareness of God, but on Yom Kippur, you don't need awareness of God. Yom Kippur, you are one with God, and that is revealed, and that is especially at the Ni'ilah prayer. Ni'ilah means locked, and people think it means 
the doors are about to be locked because Yom Kippur is almost over, so hurry up. The Rebbe tells us, Neila means the doors are locked now and you're inside the room. Neila means you're at that moment of the fifth level of your soul that is experiencing a oneness with God. It's a day of atonement. So if you want to be able to this year, God willing, this Shabbat, on Yom Kippur, to be able to experience the deepest, most essential level of who you are, remember one thing. You are a neshama. You are a soul that's a part of God with infinite potential, with incredible ability, and nothing anybody ever told you or you'll tell yourself about who you are is true. All those oaths, all those statements, all those vows are null, are void. They're not binding. They don't have to affect you because all you have to know about yourself is that I am one with God. I am my soul, and my soul has incredible power, and on this Yom Kippur, I'm going to be able to tap into it, and God is going to view me, not by what I do, but by who I am, and will have compassion for me, and will bless me and all my loved ones with a good year, and a sweet year, and a prosperous year, and a happy year, and a year of redemption. May it happen already tonight. Amen. Amen. Is at one. Beautiful. Atonement, at one mint. On Yom Kippur, we have at one mint with God. So it becomes atonement. Beautiful, beautiful. Well said. Thank you. That's the story. Any questions? No 